anyone who has asymmetric power, whether that's more money or uh, political power or cultural influence or whatever. And usually those come together, right? More money also means that I can buy cultural influence through media and marketing and paying other people to say things that are aligned with what I want and being able to pay lobbyists and campaign budgets to get political power. So we can just talk about power itself and all of those as expressions. Those who have more power within a power asymmetry both have the incentive and the capacity to maintain that power asymmetry and increase it. So they have the ability to make news that does the bidding of what, that, that has the populace believe things that continue to serve them having more power in that system. They can get representation, they can create technologies, they can corner markets, they can, whatever it is, corner scarce resources that allow them to continue doing that, they can suppress opponents. So this is why we see that Sometimes after a war, things will be kind of state, you know, uh, leveled. The playing field will be a bit leveled. And then whoever starts to get ahead will start to see this increasing wealth inequality and power asymmetry until we get this power law distribution that is so extreme that it actually doesn't work for the base and then there's war again or some kind of breakdown. But I don't think we get to make it through that process more at the level of technological development that we have. And I think we need to do something fundamentally other than that. So we have to say, why is it that that power law distribution is inexorable, right? That it keeps, that the inequalities keep getting more intense. And people argue against it and their arguments, typically those who are at the top of the power law distribution argue against it um, as a kind of apologism. And they'll say, no, technology democratizes power because look at these new entrepreneurs who weren't born into old money and they got power. Okay, I can use edge cases to actually prove a rule, but so the the internet was supposed to decentralize, be a great equalizer and decentralize broadcast media where there were, you know, a handful of major news outlets where there were the only people that could share their idea. And now with YouTube, anybody could and MySpace, Facebook, everybody could. But then, of course, what it means is you've got Google and Facebook that own pretty much all of the platform for the on online capacity to broadcast anything that have way more centralized power than any of those news stations previously had. And so it, the technology that supposedly was going to decentralize it, the, you remember that revolvers were going to be a great equalizer in a similar way, right? The technology that's supposed to um, decentralize the... Uh, power asymmetry will eventually end up getting captured to create a more intense power asymmetry because the technology equals more power and that ends up being captured by those who are better at doing the more power thing. The only way out of that that I know of is a radically empowered in a healthy and effective way base that because otherwise we say, okay, well, that's not possible. So we can't really have everyone engaged because people are too lazy and stupid and unwilling and whatever. And so we need to at least just pick better representatives. The representatives will do a good job. We'll create a thing called a state that is going to regulate and bind the predatory aspects of market. So the market can't cut down the trees in the areas we call state parks and they can't do organized crime, even though it's profitable and they can't, whatever, dump all their stuff in the drinking water. And so we're going to create regulatory bodies that keep them from, that bind the market. So then the market's primary goal is to capture those regulatory bodies, right? Any, anyone who's doing well in the market that is going to do less well if the regulators are successful, their primary agenda is to debase the integrity of the regulator. And they can do that with legislation because the lobbyists are lawyers that have to be paid for by somebody. And who has the money to pay them is the corporate interests. Um, the campaign budgets have to be paid for by somebody. The campaign budgets of your opponent will get a lot of you know, support and you've only got four years in office Blah, 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 right? So it's very easy to see how the market ends up capturing the regulatory forces to then end up doing their bidding. So now we have banks that get bailed out when they actually should go bankrupt and oil companies that are subsidized. Like, that's not a market. What the fuck? And that's also not the healthy kind of binding the predatory aspects. That's a crony capitalist type thing. So if the regulators are supposed to be able to bind the market type dynamics where the 
the predatory parts of the market that got asymmetric power over everybody else. Well, who is it that's going to check the regulators? Well, the, the accountability of the representatives to the people, where the people are actually educated, aware, engaged enough to be able to do that, is supposedly the idea, which is why in the founding of you know, the United States, and we can look at examples and other attempts at a democratized process, said, we've given you a republic if you can keep it, and the foundation will be the comprehensive education and engagement of all the citizens. George Washington said the most important part of education will be studying the science of government, not STEM. STEM makes, great, makes people who are great weapons, but doesn't make people who can see where the system is being weaponized, right? Studying history and politics and those dynamics so that people can do civic engagement is where that would happen. So you see how much the study of the humanities and civics in the versions that would be relevant for this got cut after World War II. STEM and law got much more focus. The version of the humanities that got left was a version that actually couldn't fight the dominant system effectively at all because it goes against itself, which is a particular kind of virulent postmodernism. Not to say that there aren't relevant parts of postmodernism, but it is not the kind that can actually check forces. And so you can see that in World War II, there were a few really smart STEM guys that were super helpful, right? Von Neumann and Turing and Feynman and whatever. So we wanted to find all of them, create SATs and standardized tests to find them and train them in that way so that they would be effective tools or weapons towards the system. And we didn't want smart guys thinking about different systems like Marx or you know whatever. So we wanted to... Uh, make sure that those who were going to study the classics and the humanities were typically the kids of the elites who went to nice private prep schools, went to an Ivy League, and then came into the position to do that thing. How much of that was intended versus just the emergent property of the system? Because seeing Sputnik said, wow, not studying enough science is a real national security threat, it doesn't matter. What, how much it was just a strange attractor phenomena versus strange attractor that was then noticed and acted on, doesn't really matter. But Asymmetries of power have the orientation to and capacity to increase themselves. So my hope with what we're doing here, not just with this video, which is a little part of, but with Rebel Wisdom, with all of these videos and articles and conversations that we're having in these kinds of shared spaces, um, is the the beginning of the kind of more widespread education and human development that is needed to be able to have a healthy civilization that doesn't fall prey to increasing power asymmetries and all of the attendant problems that come along with that. And I don't see any solution other than the comprehensive development of a lot more people and all of the things we're talking about here, like you can see that it's not very simple education. I'm not just talking about STEM and I'm also not giving rules that you can just understand and follow. You've actually got to be able to say, does this particular rule of thumb apply or does this one or do I, how do I hold them? And, you know, and so this is actually deepening people's depth of care. So the level of thoughtfulness and consideration and attention that they bring to anything and then they're increasing their tools that they bring and increasing the earnestness and sincerity that they bring and increasing the courage with which they do that and the humility with which they do that is all part of the development of humans in the way that we need to not have those humans just captured, right? The idea that the wicked and the weak must work together and so we want to work to address the weak as much as the wicked, otherwise there's no basis for the wicked to do anything bad. And yet, like, what? the kind of development that we're talking about isn't trivial. And so my hope is that there are more people that are inspired by this and simply didn't have resources. Maybe didn't have awareness, maybe didn't have resources and start to create a demand for more supply that is not self-serving but actually serving the development of an authentically increasing collective intelligence that is the only thing that has the capacity to actually address radical asymmetries and the corruption and problems attendant with them. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. 
Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.